All right, dear students, welcome to this extra lecture in which we deal with numerical simulation aspects within financial mathematics. Uh, one important thing are the analytic properties and the stochastic processes and working with stochastic integration and stochastic calculus. But another equally important part is to be able to simulate and to bring uh, um, processes into computer simulation so that actually numbers can be computed. As you can imagine, option prices are numbers. So here we will deal with simulating of Brownian motion, and this will be mainly important for homework two. So this lecture is particularly connected to homework two. It's not meant for the midterm, nor for the final examination, but in homework two, we will do a simulation exercise. And for that, this is uh, important. Let's recall that the stochastic process WT, T greater or equal to zero, uh, is called standard Brownian motion. It, con it contains, uh, so it's based on continuous sample paths and it's called standard Brownian motion when at T zero, W is equal to zero. Secondly, when WT has stationary and independent increments. And thirdly, when the increments WT minus WS have normal distribution with mean zero and variance T minus S for all S um, greater or equal to zero and less than T. Now, these items two and three, they can be summarized as follows. Here we, uh, we have a, a, a discretization of time already, which also forms the basis for a numerical simulation. So we uh, have uh, our time interval from zero to capital T, and we say T zero is equal to zero, is less than T one, less than T two, etc., up till Tm, which is equal to capital T. So we have a timeline. Again, here we have a timeline T. We have a zero here. And we have a capital T here. And we subdivide this interval into, uh, in this case, equidistant uh, partition with an equidistant partition into equal, uh, equally sized intervals T1, T2, up to Tm. Right, and uh, two and three also say that increments WTI minus WTI minus one, where I runs from one to M, they are independent with uh, distribution as follows, WTI minus WTI minus one is distributed normally with mean zero and variance TI minus TI minus one. Now, typically we want to simulate M Brownian motion values at these different times. So if we have our timeline and we have our partition like this, then typically we start at zero, of course, uh, if we have a Brownian, standard Brownian motion, and then we wish to simulate from time step to time step something like this, eh? from time step, step to time step, we wish to make a small portion in, uh, in a simulation. And in the end, we want to get to, to WT. We want to simulate, for example, W at time capital T. And uh, we wish to see what sort of path can be generated. So we have, again, our time partitioning from zero to capital T. And we want, want to get an entire vector, WT1, WT2, et cetera, yes? And we'd like to simulate a path. Typically, we'd like to simulate a path, starting at zero, ending at capital T in this case. Well, we can do so by using, of course, a known fact that for S less than T, we have uh, already seen that uh, W at time S plus T, can be written as WS plus the difference WS plus T minus WS. And where, and we have also discussed that, where WS and WS plus T minus S, they are independent normals. 
Okay, you can immediately ask what is the filtration? Well, you can guess what the filtration is, right? Now, the basis of this is the following. We need to generate M, uh, identically independent distributed no unit normal random variables, uh, unit normal, so N zero ones. Yeah, ZI is generated as an N zero one, and we have M of those, Z one, Z two, up to ZM. And then we can construct the independent increments as follows. Yeah, so the, uh, remember that the increments of Brownian motion are independent. So we say that this increment WTI minus WTI minus one in distribution is equal to the square root of TI minus TI minus one times ZI. And then I runs from one to M. So uh, remember again that the ZI is standard normally distributed and we multiply it by the standard deviation essentially. Yes. And then we know that this has as the same properties, the same distributional properties as this increment. So now to simulate the values WT1 up to WTM, we can use a recursion. We can always say, uh, we can make use of this splitting, the splitting that we have discussed. W at ti plus one can be written as wti plus an increment, wti plus one minus wti. So at some point we have reached time point ti and we have generated wti. And now we add this increment to it. Eh? We add w ti plus one minus wti to it. And this way we connect the uh, Brownian motion at time point ti with the Brownian motion at time point ti plus one. Remember that these are uh, continuous paths. So we write this uh, using uh, this form here. We write this as this is wti plus uh, the square root at uh, of uh, ti plus one minus ti times this standard normal, yeah, the i plus first standard normal that we have uh, made. So again, how does the procedure then look for standard normal Brownian motion? Eh? So the simulation of standard normal Brownian motion, first we need to generate these unit normals z1, z2 up to zm. You can do that in Python, for example, and you have learned Python. There's a package called NumPy, NumPy, where it is possible to, uh, to have a, a random number generator. So it's possible to generate these M random numbers. And then we define recursively, we say W at T1. Of course, remember that W at T0 equals zero, at W0 is equal to zero. So W at T1, we can simulate that by T1 times Z1, that first unit normal, number drawn from a unit normal uh, random variable. And subsequently we say T2 is now WT1, the one that we have just computed, plus the square root of uh, T2 minus T1 times this second unit normal, Z2. And we continue until we reach Tm. Tm is our final time, capital T. If you remember, is Wtm. And we can see, yeah, because we can substitute for this term here, we can substitute this, right? So if we do that uh, um, for each of these terms, we end up with the fact that W at Tm is in fact a sum, I runs from one to M of the square root of Ti minus Ti minus one times Zi. So in the end, in order to simulate Brownian motion, we only need to generate unit normals and then we, uh, we uh, combine them in a clever way in order to get one path. But again, remember this is only one path. And we have only generated one path.
may be like this. But one path doesn't give us the distributional um, properties, right? Uh, we know something about uh, the expected value of a Brownian motion. We know something about the variance. And in order to verify that, we need to generate multiple paths. Eh? And again, if we do a second path, let's do a second color. If we do a second path, we will generate new unit normals. So we have new random numbers. It may go like this. And another one, and another one. So, uh, and, and we could generate another path. Et cetera, et cetera. And if we generate a large enough number of paths, a large enough number of paths, we will get the distributional properties here that we will expect of this process. So this is a discrete form of our continuous process. For our continuous process, we know the distributional properties. We know the, the, the density itself. We know the expected value. We know the variance. We know even more. We know something about the moments. And by generating a large number of paths, we expect this to converge to these distributional properties. The discrete version should converge to the properties of the continuous process. This is a process called Monte Carlo simulation. Monte Carlo simulation. It's very powerful and it is part of, for example, of the master course computational finance that we will organize next year. All right, so this is one path. We may need to generate multiple paths in order to say something about the distributional properties, for example, at the final time. And this is exactly part of that homework two exercise. Now let's look at Brownian motion with drift. And we had a drift alpha and we have a variance term sigma. So uh, we say xt is now sigma times wt plus alpha times t. Sigma is like a scaling factor, a scaling factor to the Brownian motion and alpha times t that is uh, a drift, uh, a shift, a shift or a translation. Well, also this we can easily simulate again the process is defined similarly, except now that xt minus xs has a normal distribution with a different mean. I discussed that in a previous lecture, the mean alpha t minus s and a different variance, the variance sigma square times t minus s for uh, zero less equal to s less than t. So if we repeat this process, we would expect different distributional properties of our discrete process. We would hope, we would expect that it converges when we simulate a large number of paths. We expect it converges to this mean and that we see this variance. And if we look at the distributional properties, we expect a normal distribution with this mean and this variance, right? And how to simulate? Again, we use the stationary independent increments and we simulate the Brownian motion at these discrete times by generating MIID unit normals, Z1, Z2 up to Zm. And again, using the recursion, which now looks a little bit differently, but is essentially the same. It says X, the value of this process at time Ti plus one is equal to X at Ti, plus this increment, yeah, x at ti plus one minus x at ti. And again, remember that this is nothing in distributional sense. This is nothing but um, x at ti plus sigma times uh, the square root of ti plus one minus ti times uh, z i plus one, this unit normal, plus the discrete version of that uh, shift or translation alpha times ti plus one minus ti. 
So when we do this, we can go from one time step to the next time step, and we can repeat this recursively to generate one path. And by repeating the complete procedure every time with new random variables drawn from our unit normals, then we end up with a, a number of paths. Now, what about geometric rounding motion, GBM? So remember that GBM was also presented in a previous lecture, and we wrote it down like this. ST is equal to S0 times E to the XT, T greater or equal to zero, where X, in fact, this exponent of the exponential, this exponent is written as this shifted Brownian motion, translated Brownian motion, sigma WT plus alpha T in the exponent in geometric Brownian motion. And that exponent is thus a Brownian motion itself. Now, how do we do that? First of all, remember that we, we mentioned that e to the xt has a log normal distribution for each fixed time t greater or equal to zero. It cannot go negative. It has a log normal distribution. And how do we simulate this? Well, again, if uh, we say we have a variable, just a variable, a random variable, y, which is e to the x, it's log normal. And suppose that x in this case is normally distributed with mean alpha and variance sigma square. Then we can just simulate this y process as follows. Eh? Y is then equal to e to the power sigma times z plus alpha. Eh? So in distributional sense, this is uh, equal, y is equal to e to the power sigma times z plus alpha, where again, z is a standard normally distributed process. Yeah. Well, how can we then uh, um, simulate in a nice way? Well, recall that for any uh, s non-negative less than t, it holds that s of t is equal to S zero times the ratio of S at time S divided by S zero times ST divided by SS. And if we write that out here, we have S zero and that first part here, that ratio here is nothing but E to the power XT. And the ratio here is nothing but E to the power XT minus XS. And now again, since the increment xs is independent of xt minus s, then also the ratios uh, s at time s divided by s0 and s at time t divided by s at time s, they are independent log normal random variables. So that can form the basis for the simulation of the geometric Brownian motion. So we can just simulate a pair S0, S at time S by generating two IID standard normally distributed random variables, Z1 and Z2. And we use the following S at time S is S0 in distribution, is S0 e to the power sigma times the square root of S times Z1 plus alpha s, and remember that um, t0, oops, t0 is equal to zero, yes. So therefore we end up with this. And um, uh, subsequently we can say uh, s at time small t is s at time s times e to the power sigma times the square root t minus s times this second normally standard normally distributed random variable z2 plus alpha t minus s. And if we substitute uh, the first one in the second one, we end up with s0 e to the power sigma times square root of s times z1 plus alpha s times e to the power sigma square root of t minus s times z2 
plus alpha t minus s. And if we look at it a bit more generally, and we look at uh, a partitioning of the whole time interval, again, into m uh, pieces uh, um, from uh, t0 to t1, t1 to t2, etc., to tm minus 1, and from tm minus 1 to t, which is equal to capital T, then we can define z's of y sub i as this difference here. Uh, so this ratio t s at t y divided by s at t y minus one i running from one up to m, and we can uh, write the recursion as follows: s at t m is s at t m minus one times y m, and we can do this repeatedly all the way back to time t zero. And this way we have then simulated one such path, right? One path for geometric Brownian motion. So the, the y sub i's here, the y sub i's, they are independent log normal random variables. And they are constructed by generating m iid standard normally random variables z1 up to zm and using the following form y sub i is e to the power sigma times the square root at ti minus ti minus one times zi plus but this should be in the exponent right this should be in the exponent plus alpha ti minus ti minus one in the exponent of the exponential here and i runs from one to m and this way we can generate one such path and by repeating that with every time with different random numbers from z1 until zm, we uh, can generate many such paths. Well, that is an example, a basic example of a simulation. And with this, uh, it forms the basis, if you wish, it forms the basis for a Monte Carlo simulation. Now, how can we make sure that our implementation is correct how can we verify our numerical implementation how are we certain that we didn't substitute a minus sign where we should expect a plus sign well we can do that for example with uh, statistical tests so we can test our numerical implementation by using statistical tests and so one example is we can look at final time at, fi at time tm eh? at final time tm and we can look whether our distribution, if we are just looking at standard, standard Brownian motion, we can look at uh, whether at final time our W values have the desired characteristics of the distribution. Again, we know the mean, we know the variance, we know the distribution, we know the density. So let's see if uh, uh, our discrete approximation satisfies these properties and especially when we use a very fine time grid and when we use a large number of uh, paths then um, the discrete version should converge to the continuous version so repeating the procedure and constructing many paths say n eh, so w to the say uh, with a superscript j representing the number of paths at time ti where i runs from one to m and j runs from one to n uh, one to m is the number of time steps and when uh, m gets bigger and bigger the time intervals get smaller and smaller and j represents the number of paths so when n grows we have more and more paths to generate with more and more random numbers. And by this, we can get to, uh, yeah, to uh, an, uh, an evaluation of the discretization with so fine grids, with so many paths that we uh, expect. Eh? And in Monte Carlo, we can prove it, that it will converge to the, to the uh, distribution of the continuous uh, uh, process.
So one way to check is just to look at uh, the sample mean and the sample variance. Uh, we write that by mu n and by sigma square n, the sample mean or the sample average and the sample variance, uh, they are written as this, one over n, the sum of the n uh, parts of the w uh, that we have reached at time tm. So for each part, we reach a final value and uh, the average is averaging out of averaging these, all these final values and dividing by their number. So this is just a statistical test to see whether the uh, sample average matches for a, a large number of n and for a large number of points, whether it matches the, the, the expectation, which is zero, as you know. And the sample variance, we can look at the sample variance. Uh, uh, it is one over n minus one. That was because we want to have an unbiased estimator. Think of statistics. Uh, so sigma n squared is one over n minus one, the sum over n terms, j runs from one to n of that um, path that we have, uh, that we have the path value at tm that we have obtained minus the sample mean squared. Yeah, and that is the sample variance. And we know that it should converge to uh, t, right? t minus t0 is capital T. So we should see n, we should see whether this converges. So these are two uh, properties, two characteristics that can be checked. And if they are off also for an increasing number of paths when they are off, then we know that we have made a mistake in our implementation. Another statistical test is just looking at histograms, right? And that is as follows. Let's divide the axis into sub-intervals. So basically, let me do it back in order to draw something. So we have here all these paths that we can generate. These are zigzag curves and many of those. They all start at zero, right? So this is not there. Let me write this, put this on here. So this is not there. So we have And it all converges to zero, of course. Then um, what we do here basically is we, let's call this the x-axis. If we, uh, if we want to connect it to, uh, to the, the, the wording here, we subdivide this axis into intervals like this, and we call them bins. So these are bins. This is a bin, bin, bin one, bin two, bin three, etc. And they are of length delta x, if you wish. And then we just count how many samples there are in each bin. So how many samples there are in a bin. So say that uh, there are like so many samples here, so many here, so many here. We have in total n samples. We have n different paths and we call n sub i the number of samples in the specific bin, in the bin between i times delta x and i plus one times delta x. Say it is like this bin. Right, this is i and this is i plus one, and the size is delta x. And we approximate the probability that uh, w has values in a sub interval by the relative frequency that this occurs with the samples. So, as an approximation, we say had the probability that w. Uh, Tm lies in the interval in the bin i delta x to i plus one delta x, that is approximately n sub i over n. Yes, so that is an approximation for the probability. Now we have another, of course, we have another representation for this approximation. 
because we also know that this probability, this very same probability that WTM is in this interval, I delta X to I plus one delta X, that can be written in this case as uh, the integral from I delta X to I plus one delta X of FX dx. And this is the density function, the probability density function. Now connecting these two, connecting these two gives us that the uh, integral from I delta X to I plus one delta X, uh, which, which can be approximated by a Riemann sum, delta X times FI. Yeah? So delta X times the size of the interval times the value at some midpoint of the interval that that can then be um, approximated by this discrete version. And so this is approximately, and this is approximately n i over n. So what we get from this, and uh, what we get from this is uh, in fact that we uh, we will get some block function, the relative frequencies, uh, these are the relative frequencies in each of these, uh, in each of these, uh, in each of these bins. And so this would be frequency zero, this would be something five, maybe 10, etc. So going in this direction, so you get distribution. And then this can be seen as an approximation of our desired density. So we can plot the density on top. We can plot the density on top, F, and we can see whether the, distrib whether the distribution, uh, the discrete version of the distribution converges towards our desired distribution. And then you can imagine that for, um, smaller and smaller bins, so smaller and smaller bins with more and more um, paths, so the better and better approximation of this curve that should converge to the density that we desire. And of course, sometimes we don't know the density and then uh, the discrete version gives us a good approximation from how our density looks. Okay, a, th a third one, a, th a third one, which we will not ask in the um, in the exercise, but still good to mention. The third one, of course, the third statistical test is the quantile quanta the quantile plot, the QQ plot, yeah? and that is uh, to estimate the probability distribution uh, if we have uh, a suggested uh, value. Um, uh, if we have a su suggested distribution with the density F and we have P, a little p between zero and one, then the so-called pth quantile of F, yeah, that is ZP, the pth quantile of F, that is given by as follows. Eh? It tells us that the integral from minus infinity to that ZP of fx dx is in fact p. That is the definition of the pth quantile. Now we can use that eh, to, to look in more detail to uh, our distribution by means of a statistical test. So we have given these data points, eh, these uh, n paths, w1 at tm has reached tm, w2 has reached tm, Etc. until n, eh? then a quantile quantile plot, it, plot is made as follows. First of all, we arrange these data points in increasing order. So we give them a hat, and w hat one up to w hat n. It's in increasing order, the smallest first, then the second, etc. until the largest one at last. And we plot those those data points in increasing order, we, inc uh, we plot that against these quantiles. Yeah? We discretize that P here in different segments. So we have Z at some discrete point J over N plus one. So a relative part, we have a relative 
a, a relative frequency, basically, or a relative interval. And we plot in uh, one part, we plot um, Z, oh, sorry, W hat against this Z. And what we get is uh, uh, we get had the quantiles for equidistant P, they give us a uniform distribution of probability. Now, when N is large, then uh, uh, when a quantile quantile plot gives us a straight line with the points, then it is as if the data points are drawn from a distribution related to F. Yeah, so again, this is another way to uh, another way to uh, to look at uh, statistics, to look at the distribution. We have the Z's here, so we have F here, the Z's. And here we have uh, the data points, W hat, they go here. And if this gives us a straight line, then basically it tells us that these discrete points follow a distribution according to the F that we thought it would be. Yes. But again, the quantile plot is not asked in uh, uh, our homework too. And it's still interesting if, you, if you'd like to know more to read about this in, uh, on the internet or uh, in a good textbook. All right, now let's look at stock prices. And we have uh, last lecture seen that stock prices can be modeled by geometric Brownian motion. And one underlying assumption here is the efficient market hypothesis. And that essentially says the current stock price, the stock price at TI reflects all the information from the past. So everything that happened in the past is reflected in the current stock price. We don't need any history. That is an hypothesis. Yeah, so it's an hypothesis for the mathematical model. And the underlying notion is that uh, all the analysts all over the world are continuously busy determining an option, an optimal price. So the market value of a stock is continuously being optimized. Yeah, so therefore we say, well, the current stock price reflects all information from the past. And this can be made exact mathematically, yeah, but with S0 denoting the current stock price and S at T1, the price after one time unit, then the price development from S0 to S1, yeah, we would say depends only on S0, not on any history, any longer history of stock prices. And this is, in fact, also the Markov property, the Markov process property that we have discussed two times earlier already. Now, we have also seen last uh, lecture that we often look at lock prices. How is that, lock prices? Well, uh, the probability model for ST. Well, since daily and weekly returns are relatively small, we can uh, approximate. Uh, so we prefer to work with lock prices, as you may imagine, because they will give us a very convenient form. We, we were dealing with e to the power normal uh, Brownian motion, e to the power some Brownian motion. So log prices give us a, con uh, a convenient form. It even gives us an estimate for this sigma, sigma square, as we have seen by means of the quadratic variation. Now, how is that then related to the return? Well, log s, uh, at time point ti plus one over s at time point ti. Uh, that can be rewritten as uh, follows. It's the log of one plus s at ti plus one minus st over sti. This is essentially the same as you can see. And this is then approximated by means of a Taylor approximation. This is then approximated by an approximation is then STI plus one minus STI over STI. And the Taylor approximation that is used is then that the log of one plus a small part is approximately equal in, uh, in uh, first order to first order, this is equal 
to the small part. So uh, the log of one plus this so-called return is approximately equal to the return. And the return is an interesting property, of course, for an investor. It is basically the change in stock price related to the stock price now or the stock price you bought it from for yeah so it, the return is the the change in stock price over the previous stock price and again we like to work with these log asset prices the log prices but of course after some uh, easy some easy approximations this represents uh, is a good approximation for the return and the return is something that the investor is interested in. So we would see almost the same pictures if we replace the returns by the log ratios. Yeah? And also note that ds over s, yeah, the change in, uh, stock, in stock value over the stock value, so the thing here, ds over s, that is a logarithmic derivative equal to d log s. Now, S, the geometric Brownian motion, can also be simulated, of course, right? This is, again, Ti plus 1 Ti. This reflects, again, a partition of the time interval with time point, discrete time point. So we can simulate this as geometric Brownian motion. And by, again, simulating many stock paths and analyzing the properties at time T, we can validate our simulation. Or we can look at expectations of stock prices and variances of stock prices. Yeah. So again, a little background. When investing, it's important that the return on your investment is satisfactory. And the return is defined as the change in stock value divided by the initial stock value. We can even say, we can just see that here, the change in stock value divided by the initial stock value. That is the definition of the return. So we can have daily returns and daily returns from day i to day i plus one are given, well, we, we denote it here by r in brackets ti, and that is indeed defined as s ti plus one minus s ti over s ti. And remember, if you can download daily stock prices, which we ask you to do in homework two, then it's easy to find these returns, right? This is an easy exercise to make out of stock prices returns. And daily returns of stock prices look like noise. Yeah. So they look like Brownian motion. Often, maybe not always, but uh, often they look like Brownian motion. And to be more precise, in practical situations, they look like noise in quiet times, in times when stock prices are not jumping around in relatively quiet times. Yeah? No Brexit, no unexpected elections, nothing strange in relatively normal times for uh, stocks, daily returns may look like noise. Yeah? And the average of the returns, again, you can uh, see that as uh, uh, this is an average over time. That's another possibility. An average over the returns is one over m, the sum i runs from one to m, r t i. And don't be mistaken, before we had our artificial stock paths and we could sample n paths easily, right? we could simulate n paths. Now we have the stock price itself it only gives us one particular point in the history, right? The stock price takes one point and a millisecond later, another point and yet another. But this is then an average over these time points because we don't have 10 paths of the same stock, right? Or 100 paths. We have only one path and here we average over the time. And also the sample standard deviation is now over the time. So if I look at this picture over here, it's a certain company. And here, by means of dots, there is a company. And for this company, we look at the returns. The returns are often close to zero, right? Not much change. Sometimes there are outliers. And this is from now, yeah, some time point February in 1995 until January in 1997. And we look at all these returns. 
And again, often we say daily returns look like noise. Let's model them as noise. So that is why log returns or why, when these, why, why these returns are often modeled as a normal distribution with a specific mean and a specific variance, right? That is a basic model for these type of noisy data, this type of noise. So we have this, and if we look at this carefully with our statistical tests, if it's normal distribution, we can scale it and we can shift it. So, and we can say the area under the curve should be equal to one. And then we have translated it, transformed it into a standard normal distribution. So for this particular set, we have looked at the uh, average return over time and the uh, sample deviation, st sample standard deviation. And in this case, in the example, the average is something like this. And the standard deviation is something like this. So next step, what we do, eh, so uh, the distribution of the returns, as I mentioned, can now be scaled and translated to give us an average of zero, a standard deviation of one, and the area below the curve equals to one. So we say we have an R tilde, a shifted and scaled daily return, R tilde. And that is our R, our daily return, minus mu divided by sigma. So uh, minus the average return over the number of time points scaled by the sample variance over the number of time points. And that we have, um, so here, again, this is different from what we said before. These are actual data. These are market data. This is market data. And they are here presented in a histogram, yeah? And then we also put on top of it the probability density function for a standard normal distribution. We know it, of course, it's like this. And we have also plotted that over here. Give it a color. I have a okay, cake. I cannot plot, I cannot, but you can, yeah, I can do it here. This is our standard normal, standard normal distribution. All right, what do we see? Well, it, uh, we see that there is some excess here, right? This is uh, clearly different. So it's not identical to uh, a normal distribution, these returns, right? And also here we see uh, some outliers. This basically tells us that there are some outliers in the tails, that there are some extreme events in a, in a certain period, right? It's, it doesn't fit perfectly. It's the market. It doesn't fit a mathematical model perfectly. But we say it's a good enough approximation, right? And again, these are the returns. We do a normal distribution for the returns. It's not perfect. Here it's also not perfect. Here it's not perfect. Here it's not perfect. It's not perfect, but it is our first model for something. It's not a physical phenomenon that we try to model. It is uh, buying and selling of stock price, the value of stock prices, the, the value of a stock that we try to mimic, that we try to look, we try to look for a model yeah, based on data, based on daily returns, not so, not so much data. In fact, yeah? we have millisecond data, but we look at daily returns. Then we say, Let's, let's model this as a normal distribution. And as a result, we will see later, as a result, we get for the stock price itself, a log normal distribution. All right, I think that's it. Yeah, that's it. Um, I want to say something about the difference between the reality and a beautiful mathematical model. So in the mathematical model, this is the mathematics, I suppose, mathematics. Then uh, the stock price can take any non-negative value. Buying and selling can take place continuously at any time. It's possible to buy and sell any amount of stock. Well, we only has S, we only have S, right? And, but in, in reality, there's a bid-ask spread. It's a true market, a stock market. 
people are willing to let go a stock for a certain price. People, other people are willing to buy a stock for a certain price. And there's a difference between these prices. So there's an, a, a bid and an ask price. And when they meet, there's a trade taking place. But in principle, there are two prices at each instant in time. We don't model that. Eh? We just have STI. So we look at the mid price or something like that, but it's an approximation. So the bit ask spread in our mathematical model is equal to zero. So there are no transaction costs. So we can just buy and sell. We don't explicitly model transaction costs. There are no dividends uh, either. Uh, dividends uh, at least twice a year announced uh, in January or February, the stock will uh, pay dividend to uh, the owners stock owners in April and in July, for example, and it's announced in uh, January uh, or February. So we know that uh, in uh, April and in July, a piece of the stock price is being paid to the investors. Moreover, when stock, stock prices grow drastically, sometimes a stock splitting takes place. Instead of one stock with a big value, you will get two with a smaller value so that it can grow again. This is not modeled in our mathematical model. In practice, short selling is allowed. You can own a negative amount of stocks eh? and later you have to pay them back, but you can own a negative amount of stocks. Yeah, this is, uh, this, yeah, so we can have minus, uh, stock prices and there's a constant risk-free interest rate that lies on the basis of the of the mathematical models and it's equal for any amount of money of course that is also now not how it is in practice and our final slide how is reality then well sometimes data are missing for example when there's no trading pl taking place then there's just no data there is indeed a bit ask spread in the market there are bid prices, there are ask prices. So there's noise. Buying and, and or selling stocks cost money. So that could also be reflected in a, in, a, in a model. Well, there is in fact dividend payment, as I mentioned, and there are stock prices that are split. Stock markets close at the end of a day, for example, in weekends. So what to do with that? Eh? They may open at a completely different price than the closing price. So in, in that, also in that sense, mathematics and practice, they are a little different. And sometimes when there's not much trading of a stock, eh? not maybe in, uh, in the main indices, but maybe in some smaller indices, when there's not much trading of a stock, then the last day price, Right? So the, the daily return, and we look at the last price of the day, the last day price is perhaps just an afternoon price. Right? It's not necessarily the one that is, uh, that, that is at the last seconds of the trading day. Right? So also there, uh, reality is a little different from practice. And we also should be aware of these differences. But uh, except for that, uh, we have a nice model to, to start with, eh? and in this introduction to financial mathematics course, we will define a nice model from which we can see a number of important uh, properties. All right, that's it for the uh, extra uh, lesson. I hope you like it. It's a bit more practical. Sometimes we need a, a bit more practice maybe next to the, the mathematical uh, tasks. So uh, I also hope you like uh, homework too and uh, work with that. And I wish you a lot of success.